It is two o'clock. I'm sure we will have a lot more folks joining us, but I will go ahead and get started with some introductions and announcements. Thank you all for joining us. Welcome to our second online community education program of the week, Wildscaping for Native Songbirds. Feel free to say hello in the chat box if you are just tuning in and let us know where you are from. My name is Allison Titus. I am the Community Education Manager here at the Laguna Foundation. In addition to Veronica, we are also joined by Christine Fontaine, our wonderful education director here at the Laguna Foundation. Hey, She'll everyone. be managed. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, I, she'll be managing the chat, fielding questions, and adding helpful links to resources while we go through the webinar. Hi, Christine. Hi, Allison. <laughs> Hello out there. Thank you for joining us today and supporting the Laguna Foundation education programs. The Laguna Foundation is a nonprofit organization based in Santa Rosa that works to restore, conserve, and inspire appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands. The Laguna is a wetland complex and a 22 mile long channel, as well as an entire watershed. If you live in Katati, Rohnert Park, Santa Rosa, or Windsor, you live within the Laguna watershed. The Laguna is designated as a wetland of international importance because it's a biodiversity hotspot and home to many different plants and animals. It is also a critical stop for birds migrating along the Pacific Flyway. Veronica has likely seen many of the spring songbird migrants arrive at her door through her work at Native Songbird or as visitors to her songbird specific garden. And this webinar will help you get started with turning your own yard into a refuge for migrating birds as well. So even though many of you are probably practice Zoomers at this point, I'll start with a few housekeeping notes for a successful webinar experience. You are muted and your video is off and that's on purpose. Um, if we could see and hear all of you, there's over a hundred of you out there now, uh, it would be pretty chaotic. So Christine and I will have our video on during the introduction and closing and when we take questions throughout the webinar. Veronica will be doing the same. Add your questions and please say hello in the chat box. So once again, you can hover your mouse over the, the bottom of your Zoom screen and the option to select the chat box should pop up. So click on the chat box icon and say hi if you haven't already. We will take your questions at the end of the webinar. Um, depending on time, we'll see how many questions we can get through. However, we will also follow up with an email after the webinar has concluded, answering some questions that we didn't get to. So feel free to keep adding those questions throughout the webinar. Okay, our presenter today is Veronica Bowers the director and founder of Native Songbird Care and Conservation located in Sebastopol. Native Songbird Care and Conservation is a state and federally permitted wildlife rehabilitation facility devoted exclusively to the care of native passerines. With the support of a small team of 12 amazing volunteers, Native Songbird Care and Conservation cares for approximately a thousand songbirds each year. Veronica has a passion for songbirds and has been working exclusively with this diverse and challenging group of wildlife since 1999. Veronica became an accidental gardener nearly 18 years ago when she began learning about the vital connection between native plants and native songbirds. Since then, she has fallen in love with native plants and has created the Songbird Sanctuary Habitat Gardens on the grounds of native songbird care and conservation. Those gardens include one and a half acres of songbird habitat composed mostly of native plants, 
and support over 70 species of songbirds throughout the year, which is incredible. Um, I also have to say a special thank you to Veronica for being one of the first people to say an enthusiastic yes when I reached out about turning her program into a webinar. I really appreciate your flexibility and support of our programs. And lastly, this program is a part of our week-long celebration of gardening and plants. So stay tuned at the end of the program for more learning opportunities coming up in just a couple of days. That concludes my announcements. Veronica, I'll hand it over to you to get started. Great. Thank you very much, Allison and Christine. So um, I won't introduce myself since that's been done already, but I'd like to welcome you all to Wildscaping, which is a presentation I've been giving um, around our community and in various parts of the U.S. for a few years now. And it's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I'm giving you this presentation from our garden. Um, so you're going to hear lots of bird song in the background here. Um, and I'm going to switch the screen over um, to a PowerPoint of the, power, the wildscaping presentation. Um, but you'll be surrounded by the ambiance or the sound ambiance anyway of our um, lovely songbirds in the background. So um, I, as Allison said, I started my wildscaping journey um, and gardening with native plants accidentally um, about 18 years ago. And at that time, I was um, becoming very involved as a wildlife rehabilitator, but also with our local Audubon chapter and was becoming a budding birder. And as I was spending more and more time out in our open space areas and our state and regional parks birding, I was learning more about that strong and vital connection between our native songbirds and our native plants and the um, habitats that those various flora and fauna occupy. And as I'd go back home, I'd realize that I just didn't have the same diversity of species and biodiversity in my own garden. And I soon uh, learned and realized that it was because we didn't have the plants that all of these animals needed to survive. So little by little, I began removing um, non-native ornamental plants and slowly replacing them with native plants. And over the years, we've created quite a thriving habitat here. I'd say we have well over 70 songbird species that occupy our garden through various parts of the year. And we have over 30 species of songbirds who nest here during the breeding season. And that's just on two acres. So um, if you use the right plant choices, you have the potential to sustain and support a lot of life here, but in particular, um, our native songbirds. So if you've been keeping up with news headlines over the last couple of years, do you know that it's no secret our songbird populations are in decline? And there are many reasons for that. There are many threats and hazards out there that are contributing to their decline. But I think that one powerful act that we can all take to support them and long term hopefully sustain them is to utilize native plants in our backyard and um, create a, a patchwork of functional living landscapes for these birds who have some really essential needs that can only be met through the plants that are in their environment. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, really, is how to sustain songbirds through the use of planting native plants in your garden. Okay, I'm just trying to forward my slide here. There we go. So native plants in our garden serve a, a lot of purposes and it gives us a tremendous ability to make a positive impact. Um, when we use native plants instead of non-native or ornamental um, plants, 
we can restore habitat for not only our songbirds, but for our pollinators, which there's a lot of talk in our communities about supporting pollinators, but there's also many other layers of biodiversity um, in our own backyards that can be supported through the use of native plants. And when we use native plants in our gardens, we have the potential to create um, more natural areas for our wildlife to find food and call those places home. And we can also, by creating a, a patch of a living landscape in our own backyard, we can create those smaller patches of habitat to larger green spaces. Maybe that larger green space is your neighbor's yard that they've also converted to native plant habitat, or maybe you back up against a natural area or a conservation easement, but you have the potential to grow these functional living landscapes um, that sustain biodiversity um, by making certain choices of plant material in your backyards. The other thing that was really beneficial about using native plants, um, particularly here in California, is that you can reduce your water usage and combat some of the impacts of climate change. Um, when we use native California plants, um, just through their evolution, they are adapted to our drought hardy, um, our drought climate in California, they know how to sustain that. Um, if we're using native plants, we're not using fertilizers um, or pesticides, they don't need that. And we're also not using a lot of gas powered gardening equipment because these are the types of plants that don't require that kind of maintenance. So there are many benefits to utilizing native plants in your backyard. So, what you see here is a, a little snapshot of the U.S., the continental U.S., um, and it's from 1940. And uh, the areas that are sort of yellowy um, and orange indicate where the greatest density of housing was at that time. And you can see that about two thirds of the country is still relatively green and open space and it hasn't been infiltrated by urban and suburban housing and the human populace yet. And so from a bird's eye view, um, what that means is there's still a lot of functional habitat left out there for them. Um, you know, in 1930, which really wasn't that long ago, it was just, just about 100 years ago. But if we fast forward um, to our time, we can see that there's a lot more orange and yellow and red. So those housing densities have increased significantly. And what that means is that the habitat, the functional habitat for our songbirds has decreased significantly. And even though we see a lot of green space in the middle of the country, we know that most of that is primarily converted to agricultural use, even though it may not be densely populated with humans, um, it's in heavy use for um, human needs in some way, but it's void of functional habitat for our songbirds. So um, decade by decade, we left less and less for the songbirds and for other wildlife um, to survive in the ecosystems that they had evolved with. So all of those little orange and yellow spots, um, if we zoom in closer, this is what they look like. Um, a sterile landscape with a lot of asphalt and impermeable surfaces, a lot of non-native vegetation, ornamental shade trees and shrubs, and a lot of lawn. And from a bird's perspective, that is a very um, uninviting uh, environment. There isn't a lot that they need to survive in a landscape that looks like that. Um, and the other thing is that a lot of those plants are very water thirsty, particularly lawns. So they're not necessarily um, environmentally or climate friendly plant choices that are used in um, traditional housing developments like this. So it's a dilemma 
that we are all faced with um, today, but that dilemma presents uh, an interesting opportunity. So imagine if we took all of those lawns and we converted them to native plant gardens. Imagine if we took away all those non-native trees and shrubs and we converted them to native trees and shrubs. That would be a very appealing environment quite a bit altered um, compared to the native environment that the birds are accustomed to, but it would be a more appealing and potentially functional living landscape that um, a lot of our songbirds could utilize successfully. So we want to try and look at those yards as opportunities to create living landscapes and bird-friendly landscapes. So what components make a bird-friendly garden? Well, native plants. I don't know if you've picked up on that yet, but <laughs> native plants um, are definitely uh, top on the list for creating a bird-friendly garden. Then we need to think about the habitat structure. So there is structure in habitat. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, Water, we need a water element there. Uh, water is a huge magnet for birds and other wildlife. And we also want to think about um, stewardship. And by stewardship, I mean, what do we do with the leaf litter that falls off of our trees in the fall? What do we do with the um, trimmings from our trees? Do we make brush piles out of it or do we send it to the landfill? Um, hopefully we make brush piles out of it or we compost it. Um, and other things um, to think about are education. So as we go down this path of wildscaping, um, we're going to be learning more about native plants. We're going to be learning more about plant communities. We're going to learn about the insects that are dependent on the plants and the birds that are dependent on the insects. And then as we're implementing all of this in our backyard, we may have a curious neighbor who peeks over the fence and wonders what we're doing. Hey, there's another opportunity for education. You can tell them that you're creating habitat for the songbirds in your neighborhood and maybe inspire them to do the same thing. We also have the opportunity to contribute to citizen science when we create living landscapes um, or bird-friendly gardens. So projects like BioBlitz or NestWatch, the Great Backyard Bird Count, um, even daily observations of the birds in your backyard can be um, posted on eBird um, so that scientists can use that data of where bird populations um, are occurring or where species are migrating to and from. So there's big opportunities to contribute to citizen science through the use of observation um, in your backyard. And then of course another really important component of a bird-friendly garden is to reduce or completely eliminate um, hazards and threats, invasive species, and of course pesticides. We don't ever want to use pesticides in a bird-friendly garden. So past criteria for choosing plants for our landscapes um, traditionally has always been driven by the landscaping industry and um, there were you know, some core values uh, that are sort of marketed to the consumer. Decorative value, obviously. Um, who isn't drawn to those really bright, cheerful flats of pansies and impatience at Home Depot? And then, of course, there's functional criteria like privacy screens, so different types of ornamental hedges to screen off a neighbor or utility shed and focal points, um, maybe a big dramatic magnolia tree in the middle of your lawn. Um, but all of these things were really criteria that was driven by the landscaping industry and, um, and aesthetics and not so much thinking about all of the other inhabitants um, in the garden and what their needs are um, outside of what our human needs are in our garden. So imagine if we took a different approach and added in some other criteria that not only um, 
pleased our aesthetics and maybe some traditional ideas about gardening, but also addressed the needs of our wildlife, uh, and particularly uh, the needs of our songbirds, and also with the ultimate goal of sustaining biodiversity um, in our garden spaces. So what if we changed all of our ornamental plants to be native plants that provided decorative value and screens and a focal point, but also had the ability to restore the soil, um, add to the food web, was in some way able to sequester carbon in the way that we manage our garden. Uh, so it's possible to achieve all of these things and the key to doing it is utilizing native plants in your garden and changing the way you steward your garden. So when we restore native plants to our gardens and our communities, um, we are able to sustain biodiversity. Um, so I think about like a broader vision of that. And I imagine that every one of my neighbors on Elphick Road here in Sebastopol started slowly removing all of their alien and ornamental plants and replacing them one by one with native plants. And then before you know it, we would have this one mile, two mile long swath of functional living landscape um, of native plants that's rich with biodiversity on Elphick Road. And then imagine if the neighbors on Water Trough Road did that. Um, pretty soon we'd have Sebastopol converted into this amazing thriving ecosystem. So I, you know, hold that vision dear. Every time I put in a native plant in my garden or every time I talk to a neighbor about it, um, I think it's a powerful opportunity to do some really amazing good in this world. So how do we start this wildscaping journey? How do we go down this path of sustaining biodiversity and supporting our native songbirds through the use of native plants? Well, the first thing that we wanna think about is take a look at your garden, look at some alien ornamental plant material um, that you can remove now. After we're done with this webinar, what rose bush is slated for the chopping block? Um, can you replace it with something like a mock orange or a bush anemone? Is there another plant that would be a native um, that would fulfill the non-natives role? Where you had, did you have that plant there for aesthetics? Did you have that plant there for a privacy screen or a focal point? Well, think about a native plant that you could put in its place that achieves all of that, but also, sustains native songbirds and insects and other forms of biodiversity in your garden. You want to be able to make good plant choices, so not every native plant is uh, suitable for every situation. So research the flora in your area and research the fauna in your area. So know what kind of birds that you have in your backyard and what their needs are and then take a look at the plant options, the native plant options that would be suitable for your place and determine um, what you can plant and for whom. If you have lawn, how much are you willing to give up? Are you willing to give up half of it this year and the other half next year? Or can you just dive in and sheet mulch the whole thing and start fresh with a native plant garden? Um, Think about, too, uh, creating corridors that connect to natural areas. So if your backyard abuts to a conservation easement with a seasonal creek, or if your backyard borders um, a neighbor's property that has native plants along that communal fence line, maybe those are areas that you wanna start converting first because those areas have the greatest potential to create an even larger space of living functional habitat. So this is a Google Earth snapshot of where I live in Sebastopol. And that little area is pointing to um, the edge of our property on Elphick Road. And the edge of our property does abut a seasonal creek with a little 
25 foot or 50 foot conservation easement on each side. And you can see the swath of um, live oaks and black oaks that go up and down that creek. And it's a little oasis in the middle of um, land that is in heavy agricultural use. So there's a lot of vineyard conversion in our area, which are ecological dead zones. They do not provide habitat for anyone. Um, so you can see that, you know, these little islands of native vegetation are precious to our wildlife. And I really take that to heart when I'm working in my garden and I'm adding new plant material in. So because of what we've done here at Native Songbird Care in our sanctuary gardens over the years, we've been able to increase the functionality of that conservation easement at least by an acre and a half with a diverse native vegetation that sustains a lot of biodiversity. And I know that we have other neighbors in the area who are actively doing the same thing. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like a grass grassroots conservation movement that's happening here and it's happening all over the country. Um, but these are the things that we want to look at when we're trying to create habitat in um, our backyards is where, how can we maximize our efforts um, with the greatest benefit for our goals. So I think a great place to start when we're talking about creating habitat in our backyard for songbirds is starting with the four basic food groups because native plants address all four of those food groups and and then it goes beyond food um, the plants have more benefits than just food but food is a great place to start so we need to think about plants that provide insects we need to think about plants that provide berries nectar nuts and seeds Songbirds have um, different trophic categories. So there are insectivorous species, there are omnivorous species, um, granivores, nectarivores like hummingbirds, and frugivores like your cedar waxwings. So we wanna make sure that we've got enough food in the pantry for everyone. And we'll start with insects first. So native insects are dependent on native plants. You cannot have a garden with a bunch of ornamental alien plant species and expect to sustain songbirds because those plants don't sustain our native insect species. So insects are specialists and that means that they have very specific relationships and adaptations to their host plants. So if we don't have their host plants in our gardens, we can't sustain the life cycle of the insects that our birds need. 90% of herbivorous insects can only eat the plants with which they co-evolved. And that doesn't mean you have to do a ton of research on finding the precise plants for each insect species. Um, the goal is to get a diversity of plant material and know that plants you're selecting are insectary plants, meaning they sustain a lot of insect species. So a world without insects is a world without biological diversity. You guys have probably seen in the um, news headlines about insect populations plummeting, um, and that has a lot to do with the fact that they're losing habitat, just like our songbirds are losing habitat. It also has a lot to do with the use of uh, pesticides and of different types of um, conventional plant material that you find in Home Depot and Lowe's and other home improvement stores. So instead of shopping for plants in places like that, go to your native plant nursery and get your plants. And that will really, really help the insects out. So if we don't have insects that can't eat their appropriate plants, then we've already broken the food chain because um, the plants provide food for the insects. The insects provide food for the birds. The plants also provide food for various herbivorous species like brush rabbits and our deer, like it or not. <laughs> and then of course, 
all of those creatures provide food for the predators. So it's very important to know that our native plants are the foundation of the food web. And one third of our food is pollinated by our native pollinator insects. And we wanna support our native bees, our native flies, and all of our other native pollinators. And we can't do that successfully unless we're using native plants. So I'm sure you're all familiar with Douglas Tallamy. Um, he wrote a fabulous book that I read about 10 years ago called Bringing Nature Home. And he recently released, I think just last month, uh, another book called um, Nature's Best Hope, I believe is what it's called. But the uh, premise of his first book, Bringing Nature Home, is talking about exactly what we're talking about right now, and that is supporting our insects with native plants. And he did a study um, in fact, I think it was officially published a couple of years ago, but what he and um, his students looked at was um, an urban landscape, the types of trees that are planted in that urban landscape, and the birds that are in the urban landscape during the breeding season, and what they're feeding their young. And we know in particular songbirds, um, feed their babies insects exclusively to raise them, particularly the larval form of those insects. And in looking at all of these different trees that are utilized in the urban landscape, they were able to compare the productivity for caterpillars of different tree species. And one of the things that became very evident to them is that the native tree species were highly productive. They had the highest diversity of caterpillar species versus some of the common ornamental non-native trees like this ginkgo. So you can see 530 something species of caterpillar on a native oak back east versus four species of caterpillar on a ginkgo is a pretty striking bit of information. And in the urban landscape, basically, if you're a songbird, what that means to you is that you're living in a food desert. Uh, there isn't enough food to sustain your babies. Um, and if you can't breed and have successful offspring, then the longevity of your species isn't looking too good in that particular geographic location. So native trees, native shrubs, native annuals, native perennials, all of those are essential plant material to the insects, which are essential to our songbirds and their young. Really great productive caterpillar trees in our area are certainly any of our native oak species, um, but also uh, prunus or cherry and by that I am not talking about the Bing cherry or the Queen Anne. <laughs> I'm talking about our native cherry species. Um, maples, elm, and willows are incredibly productive um, for various um, hosts of insects. So caterpillars equal baby bird food and another part of the study that Douglas Tallamy did um, in relation to looking at the larval species on um, different tree types was looking at how much larvae certain birds were bringing back to their nests to feed their young. And um, we know that the vast majority of songbird species feed their young insects. I know that as a wildlife rehabilitator who specializes in the care of songbirds. And I can tell you, we go through a lot of cultivated insects every summer, um, but they used a chickadee pair as an example and said that the chickadee pair bring approximately 400 to 600 caterpillars to the nest for 16 days um, with a total of 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars needed to rear one clutch of fledglings or one clutch of nestlings to fledgling stage. And those numbers are impressive enough, but if you look at the full nesting cycle beginning to end for a pair of chickadees, what this set of data fails to tell you 
is that average clutch size for chestnut back chickadees out here anyway is anywhere from five to seven young. So we can probably double the amount of caterpillars that Mr. Talamy um, cites here. And that once the babies fledge, so they're in the nest for about three weeks, once they fledge, the parents continue to care for them and find food for them for another two weeks. So that's almost five weeks solid of collecting anywhere from 400 to 600 caterpillars a day to successfully raise their young. And they cannot do that unless they have the native plants that are successfully supporting the native insects. So you can see, I, are, we, are we getting the point of how essential native plants are to our native songbirds? They're very important. So our native plants provide an insect buffet for our songbirds. Meadows, creating meadows with grasses, annuals, and perennials is um, a wonderful way to support our native pollinators, but also a variety of other insect species that of course are beneficial to our songbirds. Knowing which trees are most productive to sustain the larval forms of certain insects like our oaks and willows and making sure that you have those in your landscape. And then of course, shrubs. So coyote brush, wild lilac or ceanothus and coffee berry are super productive insectary shrubs. Um, highly recommend them. They're all evergreen. They're all dense, beautiful shrubs um, that sustain a lot of life in many ways, but they're especially wonderful for insects. And I don't know if you just heard that chatter in the background, but that was one of the hooded orioles whizzing by me um, with some nesting material. Okay, so this is a, a little section in our garden that has coyote bush on the left. In the middle there is coffee berry. I'm gonna say this photo was probably taken in early August because the berries aren't quite ripe yet. And in the background is Catalina cherry, which is a Southern California native. We do have Southern California natives mixed in um, our garden up here. Um, it is a cherry species and it is a hub of activity um, in the spring and summer with all manner of pollinators, but you can look to that section of the garden anytime during the breeding season. And there are usually two to three different songbird species in there or on the branches collecting larvae and adult form of insects, um, filling their bills with those little insects and then flying off to their nests to feed their young. So we know that these plants are um, really valuable to parent birds who are collecting insect food for their babies, but also for themselves. We have a lot of different species of songbirds who eat berries and fruit, and we have a lot of wildlife in general, mammalian wildlife that eat berries and fruit as well. So, um, you know, if you're partial to your skunks um, or your raccoons or even your foxes in your uh, backyard, um, here are some great fruiting trees and shrubs um, to sustain them as well. But something to think about it, with any shrub um, that's bearing fruit is what time of year does it bear fruit? What time of year is it beneficial to a bird who does eat fruit? So if you have the right combination of plants, you can have a fruit source in your garden from one season to the next. Um, and I'll show you some um, images of that in uh, just a second here. So I like to think of um, the seasonal pantry idea when I'm planting different things in the garden. Every time I choose a new plant for the garden, I think about how does it serve the songbirds? Is this plant something that bears fruit in the winter? Is it an insectary plant? Is it a plant that's going to provide cover or a nesting site? And um, nine times out of 10, it you know, checks all the boxes. But um, particularly where a seasonal pantry is concerned, um, you wanna think about who it's benefiting and what time of year are they um, utilizing the resources from that plant. So for example, the coffee berry is ripening in our garden during the late summer and the early fall. 
And this happens to coincide with the migration of the Western tanagers. Um, there's a California towhee right next to me chipping. You probably heard him. But uh, it's kind of exciting because by the last week of August, first week of September, you can hear the call of the Western tanager all over our garden. And you can look to any coffee berry bush with ripe berries and you're guaranteed, guaranteed to see one or two of these guys uh, enjoying the berries. And I think it's pretty marvelous the way their migration or should I say the coffee berries ripening coincides with the migration of the tanagers. This is obviously an essential food to them. It helps them refuel and restore their fat stores uh, to sustain themselves and use this energy while they're migrating. And then of course, during the winter, we have our cedar waxwings visiting and they are, they do eat insects during the breeding season and they do raise their young um, on insects, but they're primarily a frugivorous species, which means that they eat mostly fruit, berries in particular. They need to, they don't have the ability to chew or bite off pieces of fruit. They tend to consume their fruit whole, so it's got to be bite size. And our toyone um, is a great uh, food source for them during the winter. So uh, toyone is commonly called Christmas berry because it ripens in December usually. But this is a great um, alternative to pyracantha, which is a common ornamental that the cedar waxwings also love, but uh, it doesn't have the same productivity for insects as toyone does. So if you plant toyone instead of pyracantha, then you support your insects and you support your berry loving cedar waxwings and mockingbirds and hermit thrushes and robins during the winter. Nectar is available in many different forms in the native plant garden and you can still apply the seasonal pantry premise to nectar sources. So ribes and manzanita for example begin blooming in January. We have some ribes species in our garden here that begin blooming in December. Those are essential nectar sources for our Anna's hummingbirds who begin nesting in late December, early January here in Sonoma County. And then you have other species that begin blooming in the spring um, and in through the summer. Um, the garden is exploding with monkey flower here in the summer as well as all of our mallow species. Um, during late summer and fall we start seeing some of our asters and our goldenrod um, and our epilobium or California fuchsia um, just on fire. And of course, those are great nectar sources for butterflies and bees and other pollinators as well. But I don't think that there is a month out of the year here where there isn't something blooming. And the reason for that is one, I live in California, but two, I've selected plant material um, that fills different seasonal um, parts of that food pantry for birds and other creatures who need nectar. Nuts and seeds can be provided through a lot of different plant choices. Um, there's obvious tree choices like oaks that provide acorns for different species. Um, some people may not realize this, but the varied thrush, which is a species that winters here in Sonoma County, consumes actually quite a bit of acorns during the winter. Um, so live oaks and other oaks that produce smaller sized acorns are um, important and beneficial to our varied thrush visitors. But of course you see the titmouse here in this slide and of course acorn woodpeckers also require acorns. Um, it's a staple of their diet as well. And then trees, different fir trees, um, ash also have seeds. That species like crossbills and pine siskins um, will utilize. And then we have a lot of shrub species that have seeds as well. So uh, saltbush or also called atroplex and sagebrush, coyote brush, all provide beneficial seeds to many of our sparrow and finch species. 
And of course, grasses, when they go to seed, um, that provides a lot of great food during the winter for juncos and our overwintering sparrows. And then a lot of our annuals, like our wildflower flowers, the asters and seaside daisy, yarrow, buckwheat, um, all of those things, we never dead anything here in our gardens. We just let it be dormant, let the seed head stay in place, and you've got a food pantry for the winter for our seed eating species. Um, and if that style of gardening doesn't appeal to you, you can still deadhead those plants, but tuck the material down around on the ground in your garden beds so that it's still accessible to the birds. You may also have um, different life stages of insect species overwintering in that material. You don't want to stick it in the compost. Leave it in the garden somewhere. Like I said, tuck it in the ground, um, on the ground in a garden bed um, so that those insects can go through their life cycle, but they can also remain available as a food source to the songbirds. And one thing I want to mention too, I think I have another slide here about the salt bush or atroplex. That's actually a great plant for finches. You can see in the upper right of this slide, that's an adult male house finch. And um, it's, this is not producing seed yet. What he's actually doing is he's nibbling the tender tips of new growth off this shrub and he's eating it but he will also feed that to his young. Um, the goldfinches and the house finches in our garden uh, really gravitate toward the salt bush um, and utilize it a lot as a food source um, through the winter, but also during the breeding season. So their finches, uh, goldfinches and house finches are, and pine siskins um, are species who they do not raise their young on insects. They may ingest insects accidentally, but they raise their young with plant material. Um, and so the salt bush is something that is important to them in the garden as well as a lot, a lot of other plant material. But I always tell people, if you want a replacement for a bird feeder um, and you're looking to support your gold finches and your house finches, plant an atroplex. They love it. So you're also looking at a, a bed of annuals here. So there's buckwheat, there's seaside daisy, there's monkey flower here. And when all of those plants uh, go to seed, go dormant in the late fall and winter, everything is left as it is intact. And that bed is filled with golden crown and white crown sparrows and fox sparrows and juncos during the winter. Um, and what they're doing is they're eating all the seed from the spent flowers in there. So some of uh, the plants that we consider habitat heroes, like if you could only choose 10 or 11 plants for your garden, um, these would be the ones that we would recommend, at least for our area here in Sonoma County. They're some of our favorites, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about them. But they, um, some of them serve multiple purposes, not just a, um, seed source but also a nectar source and maybe not a fruit source but maybe also fruit and a nesting site um, and we have this list of plants on our website as well on the references page so i think something that may not be talked about enough when we discuss wildscaping or habitat gardening or how to create habitat in your backyard for songbirds is what we call structural habitat or habitat layers. And when you walk out into a natural area like a state park or um, an open space preserve, there is structure, um, not in the traditional sense, but there is structural habitat in that space that you may or may, may not be aware of in terms of how the birds use it. So, you know, we have some generic terms that we call understory, mid-story, overstory, or you can also use the word canopy instead of overstory. But each of those layers within that habitat or that environment is utilized by um, some species or all species in different ways. So for example, we have ground foraging birds and we have other birds who typically spend most of their time up in the canopy 
We have birds who nest on the ground, but maybe they glean their food in the mid-story. Um, we have birds who nest in the canopy, but maybe they get their food from the understory. So we need to think about structural habitat when we're creating habitat for our songbirds. And again, that goes back to researching the species, the fauna and the flora that you have in your area so you know what their needs are. Do you have mostly ground nesting species and mid-story species in your area? You want to focus your efforts on that type of plant material. So when we think about um, foraging niches and structural habitat, we know that our sparrow species are primarily ground foraging or mid-story foraging species like our California towhee here. Um, and when we're thinking about um, the canopy or the upper story, we know that there are a lot of insect gleaning species who occupy that space like bush tits and warblers and vireos and our chickadees and titmice um, spend most of their time high up in the trees. And then, of course, we also want to think about shelter and nesting sites and um, what is needed by certain species in the ground layer, the mid-story, and the canopy. So what you see here in the upper left is a spotted towhee nest, and that is right on the ground in the middle of a bed of hummingbird sage. And um, if you were to walk further, you might find a dark-eyed junco nest also on the ground in the same general vicinity. Um, but they wouldn't be able to nest successfully there if they didn't have the proper amount of cover at the ground level. In the mid-story, we have a California towhee. Um, that's a photo of a California towhee on her nest in the middle of that Catalina cherry that I showed earlier when we were talking about insectary plants. And um, that is an elevation of about four, three and a half feet to four feet off the ground. So something else that most people don't realize is most songbirds do nest in what we consider to be the middle story. So that zone that's between three and a half feet to seven, eight feet um, off the ground. Not all birds nest high up in trees. In fact, actually the minority of birds, um, songbirds nest high up in trees. Most of our songbirds occupy that mid-story area. And then of course we have the upper story. So here's an Anna's hummingbird who um, in that lower left photo who is up in a live oak and of course she's masterfully camouflaged her little nest um, with the lichen that's growing on the live oak and you really wouldn't even know her nest was there if you didn't see her head popping out of the top of it. So we have three different layers of the habitat that are not only being utilized as shelter but also as essential nesting habitat. So I want to talk about some other elements of a bird-friendly garden that um, some have a connection to native plants and some of these ideas don't have a connection to native plants, but what they all have a connection to is supporting our native songbirds. Um, and one of those is the life of a dead tree. And so I always like to suggest that when it is safe to do so, please leave dead trees intact. Um, they foster a tremendous amount of life. And I know there's a lot of fire awareness and concern in California and particularly in our county, but there are places where it is safe to leave dead trees intact and they should be left intact. We shouldn't wholesale clear them out. Um, our cavity nesters are dependent on them. There are many insects that are dependent on them and the whole circle and web of life is dependent on dead and dying and decaying trees and other vegetation, um, dead and dying vegetation. So you can see here we have a tree swallow who's looking into a cavity that was probably once used by a woodpecker. Um, so tree swallows are what we call a secondary cavity nester and they utilize nest boxes as well, but if nest boxes weren't available, they would use a, a used 
cavity um, from the previous year of a woodpecker. So woodpeckers make a new nest cavity every year. They're a keystone species and they're responsible for creating nesting cavities for species who can't create their own. Um, you can also see that this acorn woodpecker not only uses dead and dying trees to create nesting sites, but they use it to store their food. So this is a granary. It's a really important part of acorn woodpecker life um, that they cannot effectively establish without dead and dying trees. And of course, once the tree falls to the ground, then uh, all kinds of things uh, happen to it. It decomposes and turns back into soil. Um, it's colonized by different fungus and there's all sorts of insect life in there um, in the decaying tree that's now available to a lot of our ground dwelling mammals like skunks and raccoons who will tear apart those dead and dying trees and find food for themselves and their young. And if you don't have dead and dying trees available for cavity nesting species, you can always put in a nest box if you have um, birds that do require a cavity to nest. Um, with that comes a lot of responsibility though. We don't just slap up a nest box wherever we think it looks best. Um, there are appropriate places um, and appropriate uh, methods to use to install your nest box. And um, Cornell of Ornithology Nest Watch has a lot of great information on responsible nest box um, management. So I encourage you to look it up and review that information. Other elements that we should have in our um, bird-friendly wildscapes are leaves. Um, don't be a neat nick. Um, when the leaves begin dropping off of your deciduous trees in the fall, please leave them or rake them into your garden beds um, or scatter them at the back part of your property where you don't have to look at them. But please don't stick them in the green bin and let waste management pick them up. These leaves are essential for our insects who are overwintering. Those insects are essential for our songbirds and those leaves add vital nutrients back into the soil. Um, all of our leaves are raked up here and we tuck them into our garden beds and they're used as mulch. Um, um, and they nurture the soil, but also the birds really appreciate the fact that they're there. Um, there's tons of activity with hop scratch foraging and search for insects in those leaves all winter long. Water, of course, is another vital feature and it's a magnet for life. Water is life. Um, and your water element can be as simple as a plant saucer on your back deck that you fill with fresh water every day, or you can go crazy and put in a pond um, or a little fountain. But for a fresh water source is really important, um, not just to our birds, but of course, if you have ever seen a bee or a butterfly taking a little drink, you know that water is also important for many of our insect friends. Um, something else that we do with water here in our songbird gardens is we have a lot of basins and swales to help capture rainwater during the winter. And that rainwater water, um, as it's soaked down into our aquifer and saturates the berms around the basins and the swales, also nourishes most of the plants that are planted in those areas. We actually don't have any official irrigation in our garden. Um, we avoid watering um, as much as possible during the summer. Um, I have a feeling this summer might be a little different. We might require a little bit of hand watering for certain plants, but for the most part, our garden doesn't get any irrigation. And that has a lot to do with the plant choices that we've made, but also it has a lot to do with these amazing basins and swales that we've implemented over the years. Okay, so something that's, as a wildlife rehabilitator, I'm just gonna tell you right now, straight up, don't cut your trim, don't cut your trees or clear brush during spring and summer. Just don't do it. There should be a law against it. Wait until fall and winter. Um, someone may be able to spot a squirrel's nest or a crow's nest or a hawk's nest because they're mostly big and conspicuous, but you cannot, um, even the trained eye of an ornithologist or a biologist, um, has to work really hard to spot active nests. So, Save a life, 
save many lives and just don't trim trees and clear vegetation this time of year. You are destroying homes. Um, you may not think you did, but it will happen um, because there is so much life out there just struggling to survive. We are in the breeding season right now. Uh, birds are working hard to raise their young. Many of them have flown here from thousands of miles away to raise their young. Uh, we need to respect that and support them by not destroying their homes. Okay, so please protect your breeding birds in your backyard. Don't trim trees or clear vegetation. Wait until fall or winter. These are some really important topics um, about eliminating threats in your bird-friendly garden. Um, keeping cats contained is a, a very, very powerful action that cat owners can take to not only save our songbirds and keep their kitty healthy, but also protect other members of our biologically diverse wild neighborhoods. So our amphibians and our reptiles and our small mammals matter too. Um, and cats, free roaming cats, predate billions of those creatures in the US every year. Um, and I can tell you that animals of those populations cannot con continue with that persistent pressure of cat predation. It's just not sustainable. Um, so please contain your cats in a catio or indoors. Um, learn how to leash train them or harness train them. I, I know many people who have done it successfully. I also know many people who have built catios and they have such peace of mind knowing that their cats are still enjoying fresh air and sunshine, but that they are safely contained and they don't have to worry about vehicle collisions or a fight um, with a neighbor's cat um, or vet bills. Another killer uh, that we want to be mindful of and also be very aware that it's totally preventable, just like free roaming cats, um, are window collisions. So if you have a problematic window um, where birds have uh, periodically collided and become injured or worse, maybe didn't survive the collision, um, please do something about it. Um, there are lots of great solutions out there. There's do-it-yourself solutions. Um, there's products that you can buy and apply. Um, the American Bird Conservancy has great resources for both of these issues, cats and windows, and I really encourage you to um, take a look. When we create habitat in our backyards and invite the wildlife in, um, particularly our songbirds, we don't want to invite them in to um, potentially their death. We want to invite them in and have them live a productive and successful life there. So looking at some of these very, very real threats and how we can eliminate them or reduce them is another essential step in creating that bird-friendly uh, landscape. This is an issue that is not talked about enough, um, light pollution. So uh, boy, it, just Google it and you, you will be stunned at how pervasive light pollution is um, around the globe and how many different life forms it's impacting. Um, it is having, having catastrophic effects on insects as well as our songbirds, as well as bat species, and even humans are dramatically affected by light pollution. Um, but just suffice to say that it alters and interferes with different biological activities of both plants and animals. Um, they, it disorients migratory birds every spring and fall migration. It disrupts the nocturnal pollination network. So our moths out there are being impacted by light pollution. And one third of insects trapped in light um, die by morning. And so we've just one, taken out an essential player in the ecosystem, but two, we've also robbed some insect eating um, birds and other animals of food. Um, I see this kind of light that you see in this image here shining up uh, a tree and I wonder, I just, I don't even know what the point of that is. It's kind of ridiculous. Here we create this beautiful garden um, to welcome the wildlife and now we're illuminating the trees and disturbing the bird who just found a nice place to roost for the night and we've lit up his whole bedroom. I don't understand the point of that. So anyway, uh, just get rid of the outdoor lighting um, and believe me, the world will be better for it. Okay, so wildscaping is also climate friendly and um, 
you can be climate friendly with your wildscaping uh, because it's going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Remember, most of our native plants require very little maintenance and we don't have lawns anymore in our wildscaped backyard. So that means no lawn mowers, no fertilizers, um, no leaf blowers, and it's also water wise. So if we don't have a lawn and we don't have other water loving ornamentals, we've reduced our water usage. When we landscape our gardens uh, with native plants and we've created a bird friendly garden, we've also gone a long way to help build resilient bird populations. Through our plant choices, we've been able to provide food for young, meaning all of our little nestlings and fledglings who are hatching and growing up right now as we speak, and also food for their hardworking parents, the adults. We've also been able to provide places for shelter, um, both for birds needing to shelter and find a place to hide during the day, but also safe places for them to roost at night and to nest during the breeding season. We've also provided essential refueling stops. So we didn't talk about this very much, but migratory birds, so for example, those Western tanagers that I spoke about earlier who were eating the coffee berry, well, they may not even be western tanagers that nested in Sonoma County. Maybe they were western tanagers that nested way up in the Cascades of um, the Pacific Northwest um, up in Washington and they saw our garden on their migratory journey south in the fall down to Central America and said, "Ooh." what a great refueling stop. Um, and so now it's just part of their annual migration. They stop here every late summer, um, fuel up and then move on. But we can create these refueling stations um, for migratory birds who may not stay here more than a few days or a week um, during migration if we have the right plant choices using native plants. And then of course, if we have this living landscape, this fully functioning, thriving ecosystem in our backyard, what we've been able to achieve is the ability for birds to survive and thrive during each season and each part of their life cycle, um, from hatching out of an egg to migrating and returning the following spring to start their own family. I threw this in here as a little example um, to say that even if you don't have um, a lot of space, maybe you only have a, a, a deck or a front patio to work with, that's okay. Um, there is no size limit on creating um, habitat using native plants. You can do that as simply as having a few potted plants with natives, and I guarantee it's going to attract some important insects and some um, provide some valuable resources for our songbirds. So I did a little demonstration garden a couple of years ago. I probably should take a current picture of it to show that the plants have matured a lot in this space, but you can take potted plants as well. There are a lot of natives who um, can function okay in potted plants. You may have to upgrade their pot size eventually, but you can still contribute and support biodiversity um, using native plants, even if it's on a small scale, it's still a meaningful action that you can take. And thank you very much. This is little hermit thrush, one of our winter visitors. And then I also wanted to just share some resources. So when I spoke earlier about researching the fauna for your area, um, Calscape, which is, um, a database of the California Native Plant Society um, has a great resource. You just log on and you can put in your street address and city and it'll populate a whole list of native plants for your area. So I highly recommend that. And then of course, um, any of the two books by Douglas Tallamy are incredibly informative, but also wildly inspiring. And I also really like Landscaping Ideas of Jays and Gardening with a Wild Heart by Judith Larner and the California Wildlife Habitat Garden by Nancy Bauer, actually. And both of those women are locals, um, but uh, their books were very helpful to me um, when I was going on this wildscaping journey. So I recommend those. And then again, here's that list of habitat hero plants um, that we love in our garden here at Native Songbird Care.
Thank you so much, Veronica. That was so informative. And I think just that the way you sum it up so nicely of creating a, a year round or seasonal pantry um, really helps put it all into easy, quick context um, to move forward with converting our natural area or converting our home areas uh, to more of a natural landscape. Um, so much great information. Thank you. There were lots of questions in the chat and a lot of people were um, contributing to answering those questions. Thanks especially to Betty Young with the Milo Baker chapter of the California Native Plant Society for talking about uh, varieties and how important those are in landscapes as well. Um, varieties to our native plants. Um, can I ask just one question? It's a two-part question and this came up a couple times in the chat. Um, it's about uh, bird feeders. So this is a two-part question. One, what do you think about bird feeders in general? And two, what about uh, hummingbird feeders specifically? Is it okay to feed hummingbirds? And then this person also wants to know, do the birds become dependent on those feeders and does it prevent them from migrating? So if you could just talk about bird feeders for a second, that'd be great. Sure. And we, we get a lot of calls and questions and emails about bird feeders as well. We also see a lot of um, casualties of bird feeders. So uh, one thing that I want to say first about bird feeders is that they are a reservoir for disease. Um, because what we're doing is we're basically creating an unnatural congregation of wild species, our wild neighbors, who wouldn't otherwise hang out together in such density. So when we draw them in with feeders, if there is one sick individual in that local population and it comes to the feeder, I think we can sort of all relate to this right now, what I'm about to explain, that one sick individual potentially infects everybody else who's at that feeder. So that's one of the downsides of bird feeding. Um, so if you choose to put up bird feeders, then you wanna take responsibility by making sure that they're clean, that they're, um, safely installed that if you have predators in the area like cats you don't put feeders out because you're just putting the birds at an unfair disadvantage for predation. Um, I would also extend that to Cooper's hawks who become very familiar with bird feeding stations. Although they're a natural predator, um, the manner in which you're presenting their prey to them is not natural. The pro side of bird feeding is that for many people, it may be one of their most reliable connections to nature. It may be the gateway, uh, that little house bench, may be their gateway to becoming one of the most rabid and active advocates for songbirds. Um, speaking for myself here. So, you know, there are great benefits to bird feeding. But the flip side of that is that for every bag of bird seed you have purchased over the last year, if you replace that with a native plant that sustained the species that frequent your feeder, um, then I think you have more sustainability long term and the potential to do less harm and more good by having natural bird feeders through native plants. Oh, and the question about will the birds not move on um, to migrate? That is not true in California, and there's mixed information about that um, for the eastern, nor northeastern part of the US. Um, but just know that birds, um, people don't know how smart they are. Um, they have genetic material and inner wisdom that uh, would just blow your mind. And they know when it's time to go. Um, and they do. So a bird feeder and a hummingbird feeder is not going to prevent anyone from migrating. Um, and, you know, you may see birds during migration utilizing them. Um, maybe it was an easy refueling um, food stop, um, and that's great. But again, you can easily achieve that through using native plants. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Allison? Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate you attending this webinar this afternoon. And thank you, Veronica, for this great program at the intersection of two topics we love, um, birds and gardening. I hope this inspires you all out there in the audience to bring nature home to your own yard. I also learned some really amazing things, just facts about birds through this presentation. For example, I can't believe how many caterpillars it takes to raise a baby bird. That was amazing to me. Um, 
So once again, thank you all out there for attending today and supporting our online programs. If you have the means to donate at this time to support our critical conservation, restoration, and education work in the Laguna watershed, we would appreciate it. And a big thank you to those of you who already donated upon registering for this program. Add your last comments to the chat. I'll be ending the webinar after these last announcements. Um, as I said, this program was the second in a series of online programs leading up to the virtual eco-friendly garden tour this Saturday. This program was originally going to be a live in-person talk in Heron Hall to accompany that tour. However, now the entire event is virtual and the eco-friendly garden tour itself goes live on May 2nd. You can watch videos from gardens all around Sonoma County that showcase water saving practices as well as beautiful plants. Um, after watching the videos, you can join our interactive Q&A that we are co-hosting with our friends Daily Axe down in Petaluma. Um, that will be at 4 o'clock p.m. and you can get your gardening questions that you may have after the tour answered live. Um, check our Laguna Foundation community education page for other online events coming in May. We will continue in this format for the time being. And we are uploading new online programs all the time, so check back often. I think that's it for my announcements. Veronica, thank you again for your wonderful presentation and for taking the time out of busy baby bird season to be with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, and I hope you all out there in the audience take good care of yourselves. Thank you all, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Veronica. <laughs>